Avatar II, The Way of Water Visionary director James Cameron has produced, written, and directed several of the most critically acclaimed and crowd-pleasing films of all time. He has won and been nominated for countless awards, which includes such genre-defining films as The Terminator, Aliens, The Abyss, T2 Judgment Day, Titanic, and the highest-grossing film of all time, 2009's Avatar. He has also made this embarrassingly mundane, tropified travesty of dumb catastrophic lethargitude, submitted for your derision, entitled Avatar 2, The Way of Water. Avatar 2 is the greatest home theater tech demo ever made, and that's really all it is. A bland rehash of a bland rehash that I saw 14 years ago. Same themes, same tired old tropes. At least the first half of the first film had some unique conceptual and technological discoveries to be experienced, and a premise just clever enough to be considered innovative. It had to establish the world, the characters, the plot, the stakes, and introduce mass audiences to the concept of remote consciousness insertion and the puppet-like control of a body not our own without making them feel like Forrest Gump at an aerospace engineering seminar. This film has none of that enticing technological conceptualization and relies purely on visual spectacle to hold together a paper-thin plot and cardboard characterizations. What it does have is literally every plot beat, theme, and character from the first film. I won't go into deep detail about the plot because, well, it's a light beer version of the same from the first film. Super mega funded government military aerospace agency wants to wipe out the inhabitants of Pandora so they can plunder the planet for resources, or in this case, colonize the planet outright because Earth is on the verge of biological collapse. Didn't we already cover this? Oh, wait, this time they're specifically targeting Jake Scully and family. That makes total sense and is utterly entertaining, or not. I sincerely doubt that a humongous organization capable of destroying civilizations and terraforming an entire planet is going to focus a greater part of their resources on taking out one guy and his family. I fail to see how Jake is the linchpin for this extermination agenda. He's really just a ceremonial figurehead for the primitive tribe of blue monkey people. His family, by the way, is just as bland and boring as he is, with the notable exception of his daughter, cloned from Sigourney Weaver's character from the first film. She's dull as a doorstop, don't get me wrong, but the usage of Weaver's voice and facial scans to create a 14-year-old Navi girl is very effective. I digress. The Earth Uber goons believe that taking out Jake Scully is the key to their ability to control the planet. Why they think that, I have no idea, since they very clearly have a vast technological strategic advantage. Mr. Cameron, Jim, does the phrase nuke em from orbit mean anything to you? Guess not. In lieu of anything resembling coherent screenwriting, Mr. Dr. Professor Cameron and his four... Wait, four? It took five people to come up with this lifeless, soulless, heartless, helpless, hopeless stack of fireplace fodder? Ugh... Anyway, this pentangle of screenwriting lethargy have instead written a wholly ludicrous and stupendously brain-glazing short-form contrivance of black magic bullshittery in the form of resurrecting Master Chief Quaritch. Played again with scenery of devouring panache by Stephen Lang, only this time they've given him a Navi avatar to hunt and kill Jake. The rest of the plot is a disjointed game of cat and mouse as Blue Corn Quaritch tries and fails several times to murder Jake, but does succeed at kidnapping Jake's kids to use them as bait to draw him out several times. One of my biggest pet peeves with the film is the forced and downright nasty creation of emotional stakes brought about by putting kids, animals, and in innocent bystanders in peril. It uses these cheap emotional payoffs over and over and over again, in a supremely cynical fashion with no clear sense of purpose, no emotional investment. There is a not-remotely-nuanced new family-in-the-neighborhood dynamic going on when Scully and Clan try to hide out with the water-oriented versions of their species. Some great contemporary social and political themes are discussed awkwardly through the eyes of a Stone Age society, in as on the nose fashion as possible, and are definitely not completely out of place in this primitive alien world. And let's talk about tone. For all of its pseudo-sentimental Hallmark family dynamic agenda, it certainly paints a greasy picture of the American capitalist dream, 
and points out over and over the ineffectualism that permeates the concept of the middle class. Well, except that Jake's family wouldn't be considered middle class. They're the king and queen of Pandora, so they should be revered and given every advantage available to a primitive tribal society. Jesus Jones, all Christ snacking crackers on a penny farthing. I... Shit. I give up. This film is actively trying to insult my admittedly meager intelligence. It truly feels like the writer's roundtable got started with the phrase, so how much of a fuck do we actually have to give? And then proceeded to try and test that boundary. Also, do they not have GPS tracking implanted into every person that they send down to Pandora? Seems like something that a galactic interstellar travel capable military government aerospace agency would do to ensure the retention of their multi billion dollar assets, a la Jake. I guess Jake or his avatar weren't that important at the time. My understanding of evolutionary genetics is painfully rudimentary, but I feel the question could be asked as to how do these two subspecies of intelligent humanoid creature evolve on the same planet over millions of years, within easy traveling distance of one another, and yet one has gills and pronounced fins for swimming, but the other does not? Is that a thing? I don't think that's a thing. In the end, the film has plenty of high-octane effects-laden action sequences, which are riveting and bombastic, but also heavily saddled with deus ex machina resolutions. Make no mistake, this is a visually stunning experience of the highest level of spectacle, with the lowest level of intellectual engagement and a vast sea of forced emotional beats. Being an enormous fan of Cameron's early work, I find both of the Avatar films painfully underwhelming, and I'm shrugging my shoulders at the prospect that this franchise will be his filmmaking focus for another decade or so.